It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, author and analyst, and Dr. William Peterson, author and economist. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Dr. Daniel A. Poling, editor of the Christian Herald and president of the Armed Services Chaplains Association. Dr. Poling, many of our viewers, of course, know you as one of America's most distinguished churchmen, editor of the Christian Herald magazine, and of course, a noted chaplain. Now, sir, I believe that you are also associated with a rather vigorous and partisan viewpoint regarding our policy in Asia. Will you tell our viewers uh, briefly just what your viewpoint is? Well, thank you, Mr. Huey. I'm glad that you introduced this television program in that fashion because I'm not a come lately to my possession. In uh, 1949, I uh, had an article in one of the important weekly journals of the country, which was titled, Wanted a MacArthur Plan to Save China. In other words, I've, I've stood through the years with uh, General MacArthur and now with General Van Fleet and always with Congressman Walter Judd. I've supported that program for the Far East and I have increasing reason for a feeling that in that was... You, you, you believe that we should vigorously combat communism in Asia instead of trying to compromise with it. Is that correct, sir? I'm very sure that that is the only hope for us and for the world. Well, coming down to today's issue, Dr. Pauling, how do you stand on the Taft-Ike apparent split where Ta Senator Taft has said that we may have to go it alone? Well, of course, it would be tragedy if we were compelled to go it alone, but I think that we must face the possibilities in the situation. I do not believe that there is an indication of a break between Senator Taft and the President of the United States. I think that uh, the Senator's speech should be read with very great care, however, because there are implications there that are of very grave importance to us. Well, you, of course, now are, are a, an authority on the Far East because you've traveled through the Far East a great deal and you have just returned from the Far East. Now, sir, do you believe that the American people generally will support a strong policy in Asia? I believe that they would support a strong policy in Asia. I believe that they can be convinced, indeed are now convinced, that the present policy, or rather that the policy that we have followed thus far, has led us toward disaster. Do you think, then, that we have to uh, take a position that we are going to try to prevent the Chinese communists from consolidating their position in China? By all means, because the consolidation of the position in China means presently a firm line formed straight across Asia into India. Well, where does that leave, leave us, sir, in the Korean truce issue? Most Americans, I believe, uh, are anxious to see a truce in Korea. Now, do you support the, the movement for a truce in Korea? We're all anxious for a true peace. This is, uh, this is a case in hand where the cry of peace, peace is as of the scriptures, no peace at all. Well, then I take it, Dr. Pauling, that if we do have to pay a price of uh, a seat in the UN for communist red China, you would think that's too high a price. Absolutely too high a price. It would be disaster. What about the position of the South Koreans, sir? Now, they are opposing some of the concessions, apparently, that uh, we want to make to the, to the Chinese communists. Are you generally sympathetic with the South Korean position? Of course, Mr. Huey, we do not know the terms of that truce, but if the terms of the truth, truce are as the South Koreans apparently believe them to be, then I am very sure that the South Koreans are fully justified in their position. Well, and in general then, sir, uh, does your position mean that you think that this country must continue heavily committed militarily against communist expansion in Asia, truce or no truce? I think so, and I think that if we were to follow the course, and I again go back to the Walter Judd, uh, Van Fleet, Albert Wedemeyer position, that if we were to take that position, our commitments from the military standpoint would be measurably less than they are today. We could take advantage of resources available to us that we have not taken advantage of. 
Do you think that we would be running the risk of the, that dreaded Third World War by such a strong position against Red China? There is a calculated risk, but whenever communism is prepared for all-out World War War, if World War War is indicated, communism will take that step because the goal of communism is steadily out in front and there is no change in Moscow. Dr. Poling, perhaps you account for the success of communism because uh, some of the exponents have treated it as a religion. Now, do, would you say that we have exported the American ideals without uh, any conscious uh, recognition of faith attached to our great money expenditures? Well, Dr. Peterson, it seems to me that we've been exporting the dollar and failing to get across the significance of four words on that dollar, in God we trust. Do you believe then that, that we need to emphasize spirituality in our effort to combat communism? We do. Religion and freedom have risen side by side on this continent, Mr. Huey, and we sometimes forget that. Well, coming back to, to Asia, sir, uh, it must be very depressing to a churchman like yourself to visit Asia now and to see all the many decades of, uh, of Christian missionary work being eradicated by the communists. Of course, I do not believe that it is possible to eradicate the Christian program in Asia, the Christian spirit. In other words, the blood of martyrs is still the seed of the church. And you know one of the most amazing stories I heard in Korea just three weeks ago was the story of 643 Korean prisoners of war who have signed a pledge, who have made a vow that when they are released, if and when, they will complete their preparation and take the places in their faiths, Catholic and Protestant, of the more than 600 clergymen, priests, and preachers who were liquidated. Well, now, what about the Christian effort in, in Asia now? Is it continuing with considerable force? It is continuing, and it is continuing with tremendous sacrifice. Of course, the foreign missionary has been practically eliminated, but there is life and dynamic power in the Christian faith in China today. Well, Dr. Pauling, you've spoken a good deal about missionaries and clergymen. Would you, as a clergyman, kindly tell our viewers how you stand on the position of the current congressional investigations of clergymen? Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Peterson. I'm grateful for that question because I believe that a clergyman or an educator is a first-class citizen. I think that clergymen, as individual citizens, should be investigated if investigation is indicated. If you're going to have investigations, then there should be no preferred class, and I want no uh, special status for myself. Well, sir, coming back, uh, ask, questioning you again as a churchman, it's been said by some critics like uh, Dr. Toynbee and others that the, the Christian ideal and the Western ideal are perhaps losing their dynamism and that we are not as dynamic, and so therefore we're, we're retreating before communism. Do you think that may be true, sir? Well, this is the great test. Please, God, we're not doing that, but there is a grave temptation to do it, and some responsible leaders are suggesting policies and programs that would be, as I see it, a retreat. Dr. Poling, from your recent travels in Korea, you have uh, been with the troops, and you must know at first hand the state of their morale. Can you tell us a word about troop morale in Korea? Well, Dr. Peterson, I was amazed at what I found. It is difficult to believe that the morale is as splendid as it is under the circumstances when men are committed thus far to a war that they cannot even fight to win. In other words, you feel that our men may not know the objectives for which they are fighting? It is difficult for, uh, well, what are the objectives for which we are fighting? It is a stalemate, is it not? We are being held on the line as is unless now there is a breakthrough. But these men who are out there for us in a war they did not choose, have magnificent morale. Well, sir, now, uh, do you have a, a simple policy that you could recommend to our viewers, a one, two, three steps that you think we could take in Asia to implement your views? I think, first of all, that we should follow the policy, the program of the men I've indicated, the program to which I committed myself four years ago. That's, that's General MacArthur that's and Dr. Right. Judd and General Francis. That's right. That's right. I think in the second place that we should discontinue conversations and talks lest we be talked into slavery until the communists indicate by their acts rather than by their protestations that they are seriously inclined toward peace. I think in the next place that we should definitely refuse to retreat a single step from our pledge 
with regard to the return of unwilling prisoners. Well, we must keep that vow. I'm s uh, some of our viewers are undoubtedly confused about the importance of that returning of unwilling prisoners. What, why is that so important for our side, sir? Because we pledged to them that if they came to our protection, we would never return them against their will. It is a vow that we've made. And then finally, it seems to me that we should give all out support to Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalist government and all out support to Sigmund Ray. We should not consent. We must not consent to the partition of Korea. Well, well, sir, as a final question now, uh, Dr. Poling, many of our viewers will recall that it was your son who had a part in that the heroic incident in the sinking of the troop ship in the North Atlantic. And they'll also remember that you have built this wonderful chapel in Philadelphia, the chapel of the four chaplains. And uh, as a man who has done that, sir, and a man with that experience, uh, what final comment do you have for our viewers tonight, sir? My comment is American unity, sir. The unity of the four chaplains of the three faiths, they had learned the fine art of living together, and so in death they were not divided. And it is harder for us to live together in the peace than it has been for our sons to die together in a war. Unity is the irreducible minimum for American security and for a worthy contribution that we may make toward world security and world peace. Well, I'm sure that our viewers have appreciated these vigorous and forthright statements of yours tonight, sir, and thank you for being with us. Thank you. The opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Dr. William Peterson. Our distinguished guest was Dr. Daniel A. Poling, editor of the Christian Herald and president of the Armed Services Chaplains Association. Honor the graduate with the world's most honored watch, Longines. No other graduation watch is so much a symbol of achievement, for no other watch has achieved so much. Now, it's a fact that amongst the finest watches in all the world, Longines watches alone have won to so many honors for accuracy and dependability in observatory accuracy trials in sport, aviation, and science, and 10 World Fair grand prizes and 28 gold medals. Now, to help you make a happy selection, Longines Whitnor Jeweler Agencies are now showing a superb collection of new, exclusive, and exciting Longines watches. And you're invited to see them. For the graduate, for an anniversary, for any important gift occasion, the world's most honored gift is Longines, the world's most honored watch. And yet do you know that you may buy and own or proudly give a Longines watch for as little as $71.50? Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. There's Sunday Daytime Adventure on the CBS Television.